On the night of the 21st of June, 1963, a young man at the tender age of 17 sat by the bedside of his dying mother. She'd been suffering from terminal lung cancer. He'd watched her pain and he slowly bowed his head. She took her final breaths. Alona, all his life, the young man pulled on his running shoes and he ran through the rain all night. That young man grew up to be the UK's most prolific serial killer. This is the story of Dr. Harold Shipman. Harold Frederick Shipman, known as Fred to his family, was born on the 14th of January 1946, and he grew up on the Bestwood Council Estate, a suburb of the city of Nottingham in England. He was the second and cleverest, according to his mother, of three children. Vera, his mother, was the light of his life. He adored her, and when she died, he was devastated. It's interesting that her death came in a similar manner to what later became Shipman's own modus operandi. In the later stages of her disease, she was administered morphine at home by a doctor. Shipman was a carer and he witnessed his mother's pain subside when she was administered the drug. After her death, he vowed that he himself was going to become a doctor and he studied medicine at Leeds School of Medicine at the University of Leeds. He graduated in 1970 and he began working in a small town called Pontefract in West Yorkshire in England. And in 1974, he gained his first position as a general practitioner in a small town called Todmorden. During this appointment, Shipman was caught forging prescriptions of pethidine, a strong drug for his own use. He was fined £600 and he was demanded to attend a drug rehabilitation centre. But another practice gave him the benefit of the doubt and took him on. This was a medical centre in Hyde near Manchester and Shipman continued to work as a GP in the town of Hyde and eventually established his own surgery in 1993. He was a very well respected member of the community. People wanted to see Dr Shipman. He seemed caring and he was deemed to be a good doctor. People respected him and he betrayed so many of them. Kathleen Grundy was a sprightly 81-year-old lady, as fit as a fiddle, as we say in Northern England. On the morning of June the 24th, 1998, she opened the door of her cottage. It was early in the morning, around 8.30. There standing, her GP, Dr. Harold Shipman. She'd known him for many years and he'd arrived by appointment to take just a routine blood test. He was happy to do home visits to the patients that he was most fond of. He unpacked his equipment from his medical bag, selected a needle, but instead of drawing blood, Shipman pumped the former mayoress, upstanding member of her community of Hyde, with a lethal dose of morphine. Mrs Grundy's fully clothed body was discovered just before noon on the sofa in her sitting room. Two colleagues who had become anxious when she failed to turn up to her pensioners luncheon club went round to see her just to check on things and found her home unlocked. They called Dr Shipman, he was so well known in the local community and he came around and he gave Mrs Grundy's body a cursory once over and pronounced her dead and said her death was due to old age. It was Shipman that advised her grieving friends to contact local solicitors, Hamilton Ward, who he said handled Mrs Grundy's affairs. They'd got no reason to doubt him. He was a well-known member of the community. He was a long-serving doctor in Hyde. 
He said that he knew this firm had a will belonging to Mrs Grundy because he'd typed it up himself on his own typewriter. He knew that Hamilton Ward were dealing with Mrs Grundy. I give all my estate, money and house to my doctor. My family are not in need and I want to reward him for all the care he has given me and the people of Hyde. He left behind a fingerprint which was later found by forensic scientists. The will left Shipman an estate of almost £400,000, including Mrs Grundy's home and a house that she owned in Stockport near Manchester. Hamilton Ward solicitors received this will on June the 24th, the very day that Mrs Grundy died. It was accompanied by a letter which Shipman had wrote on the same typewriter he used for the will. This typewriter became central to the case that the police would build against him. Staff at Hamilton Ward solicitor's office in Hyde were puzzled. They'd never acted on behalf of Mrs Grundy before. Well, they filed the will and awaited developments. And just a week later, on June the 30th, they received a letter without an address typed on the now familiar typewriter that was Dr Shipman's and it said dear sir I regret to inform you that Mrs K Grundy of 79 Joel Lane in Hyde died last week I understand she lodged a will with you and I as a friend typed it out for her Shipman had ticked the cremation box on the will form but Mrs Grundy was not cremated she was buried at Hyde Chapel on July the 1st after a funeral service attended by hundreds of friends. Shipman was not among them. It was the fact that Mrs Grundy was not cremated that became Dr Shipman's downfall. His house of cards started to crumble around him. Because Mrs Grundy's daughter, Angela Woodruff, herself a solicitor and living miles away in Warwickshire, she was surprised and shocked at her mother's death. Equally surprised to hear about the will that had been signed by her mother leaving the estate to her doctor. When she saw it, she knew it was a forgery. The whole thing was unbelievable, Mrs Woodruff said, giving evidence at Shipman's eventual trial. The thought of Mum signing a document so badly typed, leaving everything to her doctor, didn't make any sense. Mrs Woodruff, being a solicitor, began her own inquiries, contacting the will's supposed witnesses and comparing the signatures. For us to believe that the doctor had possibly forged a will, had possibly killed my mother, was a huge gap to cross. But when she told police of her concerns on July the 24th, a whole month after her mother's death, she sparked what eventually became the world's biggest investigations into the activities and atrocities of a serial killer. Mrs Grundy's body was exhumed on August the 1st, 1998, and indeed morphine was found in her muscle tissues. Shipman had not just taken Mrs Grundy's life, he tried to destroy her good name and cover his tracks. He altered his medical records to suggest he was actually abusing narcotics. He said that she'd come to him on December the 10th, 1996, and she was high on drugs, a persistent drug user. He added in illegible handwriting, constipated, drug abuse at her age, codeine, wait and see, question mark. This was nonsense and it was later found at his trial that he'd forged these medical records. He'd killed her to profit from her death. The house of cards crumbled around him. Dr. Shipman was arrested on September the 7th, 1998. With the investigation well underway, the bodies of 11 potential victims were exhumed over the next two months. Meanwhile, a police expert checked Shipman's surgery computer and found the false entries. 
that he used to support the causes of deaths he gave on his victims' death certificates. The infamous typewriter was also found and was entered as evidence. Dr Shipman's trial began at Preston Crown Court on the 5th of October 1999. He was charged with the murders of 15 women by lethal injection of morphine between 1995 and 1998, all of his surgery in Hyde. Marie West, Irene Turner, Lizzie Adams, Jean Lilly, Ivy Lomax, Muriel Grimshaw, Marie Quinn, Kathleen Wagstaff, Blanca Pomfret, Nora Nuttall, Pamela Hilliard, Maureen Ward, Winifred Meller, June Melia, and the lady that inspired the investigation, Kathleen Grundy, all died, all murdered, at the hands of Dr. Harold Shipman. Dr. Shipman denied all charges, and after a lengthy trial, and six days of deliberation on the 31st of January 2000. He was found guilty, 15 counts of murder and one count of forgery of the will of Kathleen Grundy. Dr Shipman was sentenced to life imprisonment with a recommendation by Judge Justice Forbes that he never be released. Ten days after his conviction, on the 11th of February, Shipman was struck off by the General Medical Council. Two years later, the then Home Secretary, David Blunkett, confirmed the judge's whole life tariff. Shipman consistently denied his guilt. He disputed the scientific evidence against him. He never made any public statements about his actions. He never repented. He never confessed. Shipman's wife, Primrose, steadfastly maintained her husband's innocence even after his conviction. Shipman is the only doctor in the history of British medicine found guilty of murdering his patients. There was someone called John Bodkin Adams who was charged in 1957 with murdering a patient and rumours that he had killed dozens more over the years but he was acquitted. Right to the end Shipman denied all of the charges. He hung himself in his cell in the early morning of the 13th of January 2004, the day before his 58th birthday. He'd hung himself from the window bars of his cell using bed sheets. Some of the victim's family said they felt cheated a shipman's suicide meant they would never have the satisfaction of his confession and he gave no answers as to why he committed all of these crimes. Shipman's motive for suicide, like his motives for the murders, was never established. Although apparently he told one officer that he was considering suicide to assure that his wife would have financial security after he was stripped of his National Health Service pension. Primrose Shipman did receive the full NHS pension and she would have not have been entitled to it if Shipman had lived past 60. But it's all speculation. Did Shipman do that to provide for his wife? Did he have pangs of guilt that he, he did all of these things and his, his wife was left to suffer? We'll never know. We'll absolutely never know. But a major inquiry was launched about why was this ever allowed to happen. All of these murders, the nation needed to know why. The Shipman Inquiry lasted two years. It was chaired by Dame Janet Smith and it examined the scope of Shipman's crimes. The inquiry identified 215 victims. So the 15 that he was actually charged and jailed for were the tip of the iceberg. Indeed, it's estimated that his total victim count could be as many as 260. The majority, around 80%, were elderly women. Shipman's youngest victim, that we know of at least, was a 41-year-old man, although there are suspicions that he also killed young children. 
and not all the deaths were in Hyde. In January 2001, a senior West Yorkshire police detective, Chris Gregg, was selected to lead an investigation into the deaths that he may have committed when he worked over in West Yorkshire. Perhaps the largest change was the movement from single doctor general practices. When Shipman had his own single doctor practice, that's when his crimes got more frequent. He had free reign practically about what he could prescribe. In addition to the murders, it also came to light later. Shipman had stolen jewellery. In 1998, police seized over £10,000 worth of jewellery found in his garage. But how did this happen? Even though Shipman was a single doctor practice, surely someone, somewhere, noticed the amount of people that were dying. And indeed, that was the case. In 1998, undertakers in Hyde had become suspicious at the number of his patients who were dying. And when they looked into it, the death rate of Shipman's patients was nearly 10 times higher than comparable practices in the town. And they reported their concerns to the local coroner, who in turn called the police. But there was a small police investigation, but they failed to carry out even the most basic checks. They didn't even check to see whether he had a criminal record. They also didn't ask the General Medical Council. And there was information about Shipman's previous drug problem on file. Neither Shipman himself nor relatives of dead patients were ever made aware of this very minor police investigation. No one knows why Shipman decided to do this. Why did an otherwise caring doctor decide to kill his patients? And why did he choose the victims he did amongst the many, many people that he helped? Well, various theories have been put forward to explain why Shipman turned to murder. Why did he become this serial killer? Some suggest that he's avenging the death of his mother who died when he was just 17. Maybe he injected old ladies with morphine as a way to ease the burden, to put them out of their misery, to be blunt. Maybe he just liked playing God. We'll never, ever know. We'll never know. But hopefully, lessons have been learned because of it. Let me know what you think in the comments below about the Shipman case. It's a fascinating yet very alarming and uh, disturbing case. I hope you're well and I'll see you in the next video.